This summer, we're going to uh, look at some of the, the challenging passages, uh, and, and they're ch all challenging in different ways. That's what I mean by adult content. They usually are sort of in your face. Um, I really like the vacation Bible school stories that I was taught when I was a little boy, and they're always taught uh, toward you know some sort of great inspirational end, uh, and they must be, they should be. Uh, but some of the stories are dicey, some of them are challenging, and they... Uh, and I think the beauty and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ is when we confront the stories. They've all been put in here to equip us to be followers of Christ and to better know God. And today I thought we would use Moses uh, as the challenge. And the way we're going to do it is uh, I selected a whole series of vignettes from Moses' life. And what if we were to read those vignettes, make a couple observations, and say, what do we learn from this? What, what might God be up to in our lives by giving us this story? And as much as, and as important as I think it is to know Bible trivia, to know Bible facts, to know the stories, I think that's one notch below what God wants for us. You've got to know the story, but the story calls forth in us so what? So what? And I want to start in Exodus 3. I told you, once again, we, I've got some Bibles around here, but we're going to use the text today as the textbook. Exodus 10, or Exodus 3, verses 10 and 16 to 20. Um, just to put it in context, this is Moses in his encounter after he... Uh, flees the prince of Egypt, so to speak, as being the prince of Egypt, and now he is in his encounter with God. And so I'll, I'll just quickly uh, hit this. So now go, says God to uh, Moses, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Then we skip to verse 16. Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you. I promised to bring you up out of the misery in Egypt and into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. Moses is going through his life. Moses is a prince of Egypt. And Cecil B. DeMille in the Ten Commandments is not too far off when Moses discovers that he has another heritage. That his, uh, he is not a prince of Egypt solely. He's been adopted as a prince of Egypt. But his roots are as a forsaken, a slave. Uh, his Mommy, his cousins, I, we've been praying for our cousins. His cousins are the very people he rules over. Uh, and that creates this whole Exodus scenario, the very book, which is the very thing that God uses to raise up. But that means God chooses to say, I'm going to pick somebody to lead these people. And so the whole discussion on leadership starts on this interruption in Moses' life. And he said, this is what I'm going to do. Any of you understand leadership as a call? Let's not limit this just to leadership in God's kingdom. I am going to suggest to you that one of the problems that we have in the American workforce, and I don't want to overplay my hand here, is most of us think that we're employees, even if we're CEOs. And we struggle to see this as serving God and Jesus Christ. 
But Christ has called us to serve, and, and there's leadership texts there. Um, and so our calling is something bi bigger than simply the job that we hold. And, uh, and I think that helps to bring redemption to what leadership is about and to our vocation, our calling. So, God calls Moses. I've got something. This is, that's an easy one. I've got something I want you to do. And Moses says, okay. Chapter 5. Imagine going through your life and God says, I am going, I've got a job for you. These people have been waiting for generations to be freed from slavery. You're the boy. You're the man that are going to lead them out. Yes, it's me. And then we read this. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and foremen in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw. But require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the men so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Skipping on to verse 20. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, May the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. What's going on here? Whining. Oh yeah, it's definitely whining. But what's prompting the whine? Right? It's hard. Moses tells the people, your days in slavery are over. I am here. I got to go visit with the slave master. We'll see what happens. He's going to let us go. God told me. So he goes to the slave master, also known as Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he says, by the way, God told me, Pharaoh that you are to let go generations of free labor and that are building your city and just thought you want to know, and by the way, I'm not making this up, God told me. And Pharaoh doesn't see it that way. Pharaoh the king of Egypt says, by the way, please leave my throne room. And when you leave the throne room, don't let the door hit you in the rear end and tell the people that you are redeeming and rescuing from slavery, that they not only have to make the bricks that build the great cities of Egypt and the great monuments of Egypt uh, and put all that together, but now you have to grow the straw and take care of the straw that's going to be used to make it, which we used to provide you. Please, you're dismissed. And Moses goes, remember when I was telling you, when he goes back to the, to the Israelites, remember I was telling you about how God was going to, this may not work quite as smoothly as I thought. <laughs> By the way, I've just doubled your job, and you're not going to get paid anymore. So, uh, there's no straw for you. And Moses said, now why did I take this job again? Yeah. Skipping on, 